Okay, let's open this up for discussion. Um, I have passed the remote over to the um, instrument vendor people for questions, and then um, then we'll open it for Lend. How's that? Lend? Tyler, are you still there? I'm here. Yes, but, but okay. the way it works is that since I gave the presentation, Lynn has to answer all the questions. <laughs> <laughs> and he okay. didn't know that. <laughs> nice <Okay>. try. <laughs> Elena? Elena? This is Elena Berman. Huh? Can you hear me, Elena I, Berman? Yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. okay. So um, this is Elena Berman from Los Gatos Research, and I want to start with a comment, which is that if anybody has an instrument who's, that is performing as poorly as Ty's instrument shows, LGR would like to hear about it. We certainly don't want anybody to have an instrument that they're taking data that is performing that poorly. Ty and I have discussed this, that um, we'll need to get his instrument fixed. That 18 data is um, unreasonably bad and doesn't match our specifications. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and I should point out that these measurements were made in, they were all completed by May 5th of 2008. Obviously, if, if anybody feels like the analyzer is not performing to specifications, we do want to hear about it. Um, more generally, I'll, I'll also make the comment that um, at least for Picaro's instrumentation, and I, I believe the same is true for LGRs, um, since those first generation versions that were released in 2007, 2008, um, things like concentration dependence um, have improved significantly. Not to say that there is zero concentration dependence on a delta value. So if you're making, on, on our instruments at Picaro, if you're making ambient peak measurements, for example, and you're changing from a water vapor source that's 5,000 ppm to 18,000 ppm and oscillating all around, we certainly recommend that in addition to calibrating for the isotopic composition, that you calibrate for a concentration dependence as well. Um, for actual liquid injection, um, I have not seen any evidence that our current instruments um, vary based on, you know, whether you've injected 1.6 or 2 microliters of water. That kind of concentration variability um, is pretty well handled um, and should not have a, a high isotopic dependence on that. Um, but I would just say that, you know, concentration dependence is there in these systems. It has been vastly improved recently. Um, but certainly if you're measuring samples that are variable by you know, thousands of PPM differences, we certainly encourage that, that you would calibrate for that as well. This is Elena Berman from Los Gatos Research again. And Kate, what Kate just said about the, um, the dependency is also true for the LGR instruments, that that is much improved in the new versions of the instruments. Yeah. Half question. This is a high ping chi from US Geologic Survey. This is to vendors. What is your recommendation about the labs who has the old version laser instrument generate a low quality data? Buy a new one or send in to refurbish? is to contact us directly. We will run some uh, diagnostic tests on the instrument to see how it's performing and be able to make the best recommendation for where to proceed from there. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions from the audience? Hey. Um, we're trying to ask questions here in Menlo. Give us a chance. 
I guess you can't quite hear them. Hi. Uh, since Taylor has used both the methods to compare, so you could able to say that there are some deviations and they are you know, not uh, not accurate. But then, if we are only dependent on one measurement, how would we know that we are getting the proper results or not? That's exact. Oh, the, the the question was, if one only has one measurement, how does one know whether the the delta value is correct or not? And that's exactly the problem. And that's why Picaro and Los Gatos Research are working so diligently to try to populate their spectral interference software with every compound that they can think of so that this doesn't happen to users. Okay, Elena, okay. response? So um, this is Kate Dennis again from Picaro. Um, just to chime in there, um, Ty, you're right in that what we're trying to do is improve different software tools that can help users identify and flag. Um, it's not only a matter of trying to figure out what all the different spectra are for all the different other things that could be on your water. That's almost a, um, a over-ambitious task in that there are so many different compounds out there and the, the reality is, is often you as a user don't know what's in that water and we recognize that as well. So in addition to perhaps including spectra that we think could be a contaminant, methanol, ethanol, which we know are in those regions. You can also look at other spectroscopic features, the baseline. You can look at the residuals and the fit. Um, and those are the types of things that the spectral interference software um, that we have at Picaro, ChemCorrect, looks at. Um, we also, going forward, would like to move towards a more real-time flagging, so it's not just after the fact once you've got your data out of your coordinator in the case of the Picaro that you run it through interference software, but that also you have real-time flagging um, software that will say at that point in time, this sample looks suspicious to us. Um, and so that at the very least, even if you can't correct for everything, that you can understand when you should and should not trust that data because of spectroscopic interferences. Thank you. Um, this is Elena Berman from Los Gatos Research, and um, I agree pretty much with everything that Kate just said. Using the spectrum, the high-resolution spectrum that we produce on our instruments, we can tell whether there's spectral interference, even if we have no idea what the interferent may be, because we see it in the spectrum, in the residual. And so our integrated um, post-processor and spectral contaminant identifier does just that. Um, and um, is, is a big step towards your suggestion of having the um, real time, or at least it's not an extra step. As you're analyzing the data, you will know if there has been spectral contamination. And I would say if you have data that is that appears to be off, and yet the spectral contamination identifier does not um, flag that, we would certainly be interested in finding out about it and seeing the spectra and maybe getting some samples so that we can take a look and see if there's something we can do to improve. Are there any other questions here in Menlo Park before we pass it over to people in uh, Reston or Tyler, you answer chat questions? Oh, let's see, there's one question. What would be the best way to process precipitation samples to be run by uh, a Los Gatos LAS to avoid contamination? I I would say with precipitation samples, those are the best samples of all possible of, of all the samples we analyze. I don't think you have to do anything. They should be nice and clean. You just want to make sure you have them sealed with a, uh, a poly seal cap so you don't have any evaporation, but uh, take them back to the lab and analyze them and they're just like tap water samples, probably better. Tyler, this, this is, is Carol. Sorry, uh, quick. Has, has, has anyone reported problems with the kind of oils that are added to rain samplers and then running the samples on, on, on the laser spec afterwards? I do not know anything about that, but Lynn might. 
Yeah, I can jump in here on that question um, because our laboratory was the one that measured these um, crazy Costa Rican samples. You have to remember that for the GNIP stations, um, the recommended way to prevent ev evaporation is to add paraffin oil. Now, in my former laboratory, we did this, and we had no problems whatsoever with paraffin oil. It doesn't, um, it's immiscible with the water. You can simply um, use a separation funnel to get the clean water out the end. We never had any problems. This particular case, um, samples were sent here for analysis, and we ran into this problem. And all we were told was that they had collected the samples and used paraffin oil to prevent evaporation. Now, of course, we have no idea of knowing what else was in that sample, but there was no indication, as mentioned, that there's anything wrong with these. Second point is that over the last two years that I've been here, we've measured over 4,000 samples by both technologies. Now, we haven't gone back in detail and looked at, that, at the comparative effects, but there is a, a troubling proportion of samples that do not agree very well. Um, and I would say, I mean, I'm just guessing here, it might be in the 1% or 2 to 3% range um, where there's a, a stark disagreement between the laser result and the IRMS. We run it again and a third time to see which it agrees with, and even possibly a fourth or fifth time. Um, and then we will always defer to the RMS, uh, which is a dual inlet equilibration method for the final result. So I think this is something we're going to have a look at um, in the data that we produce over the next couple of years, or next year, or, and have a, maybe a hindcast at some of the samples that were run previously that came up with this problem. Um, okay.